a Believers' Convention sponsored by Kenneth Copeland Ministries in Anaheim, California. This was a powerful meeting, and the message that I shared in one of the sessions is entitled, The Anointing Breaks the Yoke. I believe that you're going to witness a powerful anointing. I believe you're going to receive some revelation knowledge that will help you, particularly if you are experiencing any area of bondage in your life. I show you from the authority of God's Word how that you can tap into God's anointing. You know, many times people think the only time that you can experience God's anointing is when you're in a large crusade, when you're in a service of some kind. But I have discovered that you can tap into God's anointing in your automobile. You can tap into God's anointing in your bedroom, in your prayer closet. It's just learning how. And on this message, you're going to learn how that God's anointing can come on the scene wherever you're at. You just have to learn how to get into it. And I believe that this message will show you how. Once again, is it entitled, The Anointing Breaks the Yoke? I believe you're going to enjoy it, so I want you to view it now. And in a moment, I'll return with some closing remarks. Open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 10. Let's look at verse 24 once again. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian, he shall smite thee with a rod, shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. For yet a very little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. And as his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. And it shall come to pass. Say, it shall come to pass. Come to pass. Say, it shall come to pass. It shall come to pass. I don't know about you, but every time I read that phrase, it excites me. If God says something will come to pass, you can count on it. It shall come to pass. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken from off thy shoulder. You ever felt like you're carrying a million pounds around with you? You ever experienced a deliverance and then said, I feel like there's a thousand pounds been lifted off my shoulders. Well, that's the way burdens are. And I might add right here that God did not create you to carry burdens. He created mules to carry burdens. Moving right along. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken from off thy shoulder. Now, who put this burden on their shoulder? The Assyrian or the enemy? Now, you have an enemy. His name is Satan. And he wants to put his burden on your shoulder. If he can put his burden on your shoulder, then it will restrict you and limit you and confine you. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck. Now, we don't, we don't uh, talk a whole lot about yoke in our modern society. But in Bible days, in Jesus' time, and not too long ago, even in this century, it was not uncommon to see a yoke you know, particularly in uh, uh, farming. And here you, you see in the Bible many times where oxen are yoked together. And the yoke was an instrument that was put around their neck that controlled them. And that's exactly what the devil wants to do to the body of Christ. Put his yoke around your neck because if he can get his yoke around your neck, then he's in charge. Amen. Many times when you when you experience uh, times when uh, you, you feel so limited, you can't do what you want to do. There's a yoke involved somewhere. Satan's trying to put his yoke around your neck to manipulate your life, to lord over you, to dominate you. Now, you know as well as I do, the devil's not going to come in and say, I'm the devil, here's my yoke, jump in. The only way that he can get a yoke around your neck, and particularly you and me, because we're determined we're going to believe the Word, the only way he could possibly get a yoke around our neck is through deception. Deception. We need to realize that deception is Satan's mightiest weapon. It's really the only thing he has going for him. Deception. 
That's the reason the Bible calls him darkness and calls God light. Deception needs darkness in order to pull off its scheme. How many uh, folks do you suppose have been robbed in dark alleys with an unloaded finger? Hmm. How many people do you suppose have yielded everything they had in their pockets, their money, their watch, everything, because somebody came up behind them in a dark place and said, stick them up. And they assumed that was a gun they had in their pocket. Now, had they been in the light and turned around there and looked, notice it's not a gun, it's the man's finger. All you got to do is turn around, grab his finger, bend it real hard, and there'll be no theft. Amen. How many, how many times do you suppose banks have been robbed with Mattel toy pistols, assuming they were guns? That's deception. Deception. How many times have you ever uh, been frightened by something that you thought was something else, a shadow or something? I remember one time many years ago, back in the uh, 60s, when I was stationed at Fort Dix, New Jersey, I was on guard duty one night, and uh, I had my, my particular guard duty this particular night was to guard the company commander's tree, <laughs> a new tree he'd planted out in front of the you know, headquarters. Wasn't about that tall, and my job that night was to guard that tree all night long as if somebody wanted it. <laughs> Can you imagine Russians? invading America for that tree. But anyway, I had to stay up all night and guard that little tree. And uh, I'm walking around, you know, the headquarters there, and, and then every time I'd come by this tree, I was, you know, I'm supposed to make sure it's still there. And I remember one night, or that particular night, the moon was shining pretty bright, and uh, I kept passing by that tree and the lighter it got, or the, the closer to dawn, I saw something laying down alongside that tree that looked like a snake. And then I thought, no, that's a stick. But we don't want to take any chances. Because the rifle they gave me has no ammunition. If somebody wants the tree, you got to beat them in the head with the butt of the rifle. You know, you don't get no bullets. And uh, so I'm, I'm walking around, and every time I'd come back around, I'd look at that, and it, and it looked like a snake. And the lighter it got, I was convinced that was a snake. I stood there one time. I know I stood there at least 10 minutes, frozen, not moving, and I could swear that thing was moving. Because I kept looking at it, and the more I looked at it, it looked like it moved, and it's getting closer to me. And I just knew it was a snake. I stood there until morning. And all it was was a stick. <laughs> but it looked like a snake. It didn't have to be a snake at the time to create fear. All it had to do was look like a snake. Are you still here? Now notice he says, It shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Now once the devil puts his burden on your shoulder and his yoke around your neck, the only way to get it off is through the anointing. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke. Everybody say out loud, the anointing breaks the yoke. The breaks the yoke. Say it again. The say it louder. The breaks the yoke. Louder. The breaks the yoke. Just a little bit louder. The breaks the yoke. He says the anointing destroys or breaks the yoke. Now, once that yoke is around your neck, you can't wish it off. You can't desire it off. You can't hope it off. It takes the anointing to break it. Let me give you an illustration of what it looks like 
when Satan has deceived you and put a yoke around your neck. Now, you realize, particularly with what you've been hearing Brother Copeland preach the last couple of nights, you realize that you have a covenant with God and you're the one with authority. The devil does not have the authority. You're the one with the authority. Jesus said, all power, that must include what the devil had, all power has been given unto me both in heaven and in earth. Now you go. See, he gave you the power of attorney to use that power and that authority. You're the one with the authority. You're the one with the power, not the devil. And the only way that he can overpower you is through deception. Deception. Now, to give you an example of what I'm talking about, an illustration, I'm going to ask my brother here on the corner to come and help me illustrate something. Now, I want you to notice that this is, a, this is a big man coming here. Very big man. Come on up here. Very tall, very strong, very able. <laughs> very big man. <laughs> now, ain't no way you're going to believe that I can throw him on his back. You believe I can? No way. There's no way. I mean, how am I going to do it? I can't even pick his leg up. What, the moment I tried, I felt this firmness come into that leg, and it, and it wouldn't move. How am I going to throw him on his back, little runt like me, up next to him? Ain't no way I'm going to flip him over on his back. And he's certainly not going to do it because I asked him to. Would you please take on my yoke and my burden and get on your back? The only way I'm going to be able to get him down is through deception. I can't do it in my own strength. I don't have the strength to do it. I can't do it in my own ability. I don't have the ability to do it. This is you as a believer. I'm the devil in this illustration only. <laughs> I'm not your enemy. There's no way I, playing the devil's part, can throw him on his back, him playing the believer's part, without me somehow or another deceiving him. Because in the eyes of God, this is you and this is the devil. In fact, God says at the end of the ages, when we all look at the devil, we'll say, is this the man that deceived the, the, the nations? He's not nearly as big as you think he is. He's not nearly as powerful as you think he is, and he can't do half what he's telling you he can do. Amen. The only way he can pull it off is through deception. Now, the only way I'm going to be able to put my yoke, I can't even reach his neck, much less put it around him. <laughs> Only way I can put a yoke around this guy's neck is I'm going to have to deceive him somehow. Now, I don't know what it would take to make him believe. I mean, I'd have to distort his mind somehow to make him believe that I am stronger than him, I am more powerful than him, and he is a, <laughs> let's let him laugh. That's, e that's exactly the way you ought to do the devil when he comes up there. Amen. When the devil comes up there and says, you're not going to get your return this time. You ought to do what he does. Do it again. <laughs> I love it. When the devil says, you're not going to get your healing this time, you say. <laughs> when the devil says, I'm going to break your back and I'm going to stomp your head and I'm going to destroy your life. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, the only reason you're not doing that to the devil because you're deceived. What happened to all the roar? Deception. Now, somehow or another, I'm going to have to deceive him before I can get my yoke around his neck. Now, I don't know what it would take. Obviously, 
it'd take a lot with him. But let's just suppose, suppose, you got that suppose, for the purpose of illustration, <laughs> let's suppose that somehow or another through all of my planning, my plotting, and my scheming, I finally managed to deceive him into believing that I am mightier than he. And I get that yoke around his neck. The only way I'm going to be able to do it is deception. We're assuming you've been deceived. Now, you got to play this part. <laughs> you are deceived. <laughs> I've got my yoke around his neck now because he's deceived. <laughs> now, I want you to notice what happens when one is deceived and has a yoke around their neck. He who is weaker becomes stronger and manipulates. I can take him anywhere I want to take him. I can make him do anything I want him to do. I can tell him, just stand there now. There's another believer down the road that I'd like to discourage. You wait until I get back. In fact, if, this, if I can keep him deceived, it becomes lifestyle with him, and I really don't even have to go, go you know, uh, trick him anymore. All I got to do is act like it's time for the yoke again. Amen. He'll finally get to the place where he'll stay like this all the time. He'll finally get to the place where he believes he can't do anything that God says he can do. He can't go where God says he can go. He can't have what God says he can have. I've got his life under control now. I've got my yoke around his neck. I got my burden on his shoulders. Now I want you to notice, even in the illustration, even in the illustration, this is degrading, folks. I mean, this great, big, strong, mighty man is bowed over. The slave of a wimp. <laughs> it's embarrassing. I mean, I even hate to use the guy in the illustration. What he don't realize is this is going out over national television. <laughs> no, nobody will remember me, but they'll never forget him. I mean, his first opportunity for national television, look at him. This is degrading, folks. It's embarrassing. If he'd have known we were going to do this, he would not have participated. <laughs> He's turning red now. I think the I've got him. Heavy. The yoke is getting heavy. I think I've got him where I want him. There's only one thing that's going to get him out of this position. The anointing. The anointing. The anointing. You see, some of you, your life is like this. Satan's got his yoke around your neck. The highest form of deception is when you're deceived and don't even realize it. Amen. Amen. Now, this is getting very uncomfortable. Amen. I mean, the man has a right to be standing up Amen. right instead of bowed over like this. But as long as my yoke is around his neck, he can't straighten up. Not until he taps into the anointing. Now, somewhere along the line, this man has got to find out about the anointing. And once the anointing comes, it destroys, breaks the yoke forever. Amen? Now, would you just stand right there for a moment? We're assuming he's still got a yoke around his neck. He's been deceived. He don't, he, he's living way below his privileges as a child of God. He's letting somebody who's already been whipped and defeated and stripped of his armor manipulate his life. Do you realize Jesus has already defeated the devil? He's already stripped him of his armor. Amen. He gave you power and authority over all devils, over all sickness. 
Amen. We have the authority. We ought to be walking upright in the earth. We ought to be walking with our heads up, praise God. We ought to be walking around like we own the earth. We are the meek and we have inherited it. Amen. We are covenant people. We have a right. We ought not be bowed over like that. In fact, that's what Jesus told that woman that had been bowed over for 18 years. The first thing he said is, ought not this woman be loosed from this infirmity, seeing she is the daughter of Abraham? What did the daughter of Abraham have to do with it? She was a covenant woman, and covenant people ought not be bowed over. They ought to be upright. Amen. Amen. We've been living way below our privileges because of deception. Deception comes most of the time because of a lack of knowledge. A lack of knowledge. God said it destroys these people. Well, if a lack of knowledge destroys them, an abundance of it will raise them up. And that's why you're here this week, to get knowledge. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, notice it said it takes the anointing to destroy the yoke. The anointing. Say, the anointing breaks the yoke. The anointing breaks the yoke. Now, listen to this. Would somebody bring him a chair where he can sit here because he's, he's not through participating yet. And there's no need him having to stand up all that time. Sit down. <laughs> You're still deceived. If he ever gets undeceived, I've had it. <laughs> Amen. I've had it. Amen. All right, now notice what it says. And the anointing or the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. The companion Bible says it this way. It will be destroyed at the very sight of the anointing. At the very sight of it. At the very sight of the anointing, the yoke will be destroyed. In other words, what he's saying is, if the anointing ever shows up, yokes must leave. Did you hear me? At the very sight of the anointing, the moment the anointing comes on the scene, it is understood, all yokes know, when anointing comes in, you must go. Now, the problem is God's people haven't known how to tap into the anointing. In fact, most of you right now, when I, when, as I'm talking about the anointing, you automatically relate it to a, a, a meeting, a crusade, uh, an evangelistic campaign, some preacher with a great gift. That's not the only way the anointing can come. Some of the greatest times to experience the anointing is in your car. In your prayer closet, you can experience the anointing while you're washing dishes, while you're washing clothes. You can experience the anointing driving home. You can experience it sitting right out there. You don't have to have a meeting like this to tap into the anointing. Amen. The Bible shows us how to tap into the anointing. Are you interested? It's not restricted to a meeting. It's not restricted to a crusade. It's not restricted to an Oral Roberts campaign. It's not restricted to a T.L. Osborne campaign. It's not restricted to Nigeria. It's not restricted to some other nation. It has no restrictions. The problem is the people haven't known how to tap into it. But we're going to learn today. And the anointing will destroy the yoke. It will destroy it, praise God. Leave no evidence there ever was a yoke. Are you ready? I want you to turn, if you will, to Genesis chapter 27. Very quickly. Genesis chapter 27. The Living Bible says when the anointing comes, it will end the bondage. It will end it. it that, that'll be the end of it, praise God. How many of you would like to see the end of bondage? Genesis chapter 27. Our dear brother here would love to see the end of this bondage. Get up and walk around a little bit. Do you notice how he obeys? <laughs> now sit down. He's still deceived. As long as he's deceived, I got control. If he ever finds out about this anointing business, 
we're in trouble. <laughs> Genesis chapter 27 is the story of Isaac. He's an old man. He's about to die. He has two sons, Esau and Jacob. Esau being the oldest. And it's customary that the father confer the blessing on the oldest son. Isaac is almost ready to die. He calls his son Esau to his bedchamber, and he tells him that he's about to die, and before he does, he must confer the blessing upon him. He tells him to go to the field. Now, Esau was a hunter, and he tells him to go to the field and to kill an animal, and bring it back, prepare it for him, that he may eat it, worship God, and then he would confer the blessing on Esau and die. So Esau understands this, and he goes to the field to kill an animal. What Esau didn't know and what Isaac didn't know is that Rebekah overheard the conversation, and she goes to Jacob and tells him, your father is about to die, and your brother is going to inherit the blessing. But I've devised a plan whereby we can deceive them, and you'll receive the blessing. You see, this is what it's all about. This is why the devil wants to deceive you, is to keep you from receiving your blessing. As we learned last night, we are the firstborn. And we are entitled to God's blessings. Not because we're so goody-goody, because of what Jesus did at Calvary, praise God. We are entitled to the blessings. We are heirs of God. Join heirs with Jesus Christ. You are entitled to everything God promised Abraham. This is an everlasting covenant. You're an heir. Now, let me just submit this to you for consideration. If you or if I am not enjoying the blessings God promised me, then there is deception somewhere. I'm being robbed because I have a right to it. It's just like many situations where uh, someone dies, even, even today, someone dies and they've written out a will and, and they, they, they stipulate in that will who gets what. And many times the people that uh, are entitled to the inheritance don't get it because of deception. Well, that's the way the devil operates. He is the master of deception. Any deception you see in the form of humans, they learned it from the devil. He's the master. Are you still here? And so Rebecca tells Jacob, I've devised a plan whereby we can deceive them and you will inherit the blessing instead of your brother Esau. And Jacob says, well, I don't understand how we can do it. She said, well, we're going to kill an animal and we're going to put the skins of that animal on you and put the scent of that animal on you so that when you go into your father Isaac, he will think you are Esau. You see, Esau was a hairy man. And Jacob was a smooth-skinned man. And that's the reason Jacob didn't think it would work because he said, the moment I go in there to my father, he'll reach over and touch me and he'll not feel a hairy skin and he'll know that I am a deceiver. And she said, no, I've taken care of that. Now, you see, the devil will go to any length to deceive you. She said, we'll just take the skin of those animals and place them on your body, put the, put the scent of the animal on you where you'll smell like Esau. And when you go in there, your, Isaac's eyes are dim and he won't be able to see and he'll, all he can hear is your voice and he'll feel the skin. And so they did it. And Jacob goes in posing as Esau. He kneels down at his father's bed. He says, I have come with the meat. And Isaac says, it is the voice of Jacob. He recognized the voice. It didn't sound like Esau. He said, this is Jacob's voice. But then he reached over and put his hand on his arm, and he felt the hair. And he said, but it is the skin of Esau. Deception. And so he ate, he worshiped God, and he conferred the blessing on the wrong one. Are you still with me? He conferred the blessing on Jacob. Jacob leaves. In a few moments, Esau returns from the field. He doesn't know that this has happened. He returns from the field. He comes into Isaac. He says, my father, I have returned with the meat. 
I am now ready to offer it to you, and I am ready to receive my blessing. And Isaac says, I don't understand. You just left. He said, no, my father, I did not. I have just returned from the field. And Isaac begins to tell him what happened. I want you to pick it up here in verse 35. The only reason I didn't read all that is for the sake of time. You can read it, and you'll find out what I just described to you was so. Genesis chapter 27, verse 35. And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety. Say subtlety. subtlety. You remember what God said about the serpent in the Garden of Eden? Describing Satan. He's the most subtle beast of the field. Satan is subtle, deceptive. He's had thousands of years to become a master at deception. You ever, you, you remember reading about or seeing, I think they made a movie one time many years ago, Tony Curtis played in it about the imposter. And he, he posed as a doctor, he posed as an admiral in the Navy or something and, and got away with it. The devil is a master deceiver. The Bible even says he has the ability to transform himself into an angel of light. That's the reason you owe it to yourself to become established in God's Word and don't just take a preacher's opinion. Amen. You need to be established. You need to be established. Because if Satan comes in posing as an angel, see, this is where a lot of people have been deceived. I've heard somebody say, an angel came to me and told me it wasn't God's will that I be healed. Well, you see, that's deception. That was Satan posing as an angel of light. Are you still here? That's the reason the Bible says try the spirits. Deception is the only way the devil can rob you of your rightful inheritance. And if he can rob you of it, he'll put a yoke around your neck and manipulate your life. Now notice what he says. Thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. That's what the devil's after, to take away your blessing. And he said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he had supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. And behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him a lord, uh, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants. And with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. And look at verse 40 very closely. And by thy sword shalt thou live and shalt serve thy brother. Now I want you to notice, because of deception, the heir is having to serve a deceiver. Are you still here? Esau was the rightful heir, but because of deception, he's not walking in his rights and privileges. He's having to become subordinate to the one that deceived him. Now notice this. And by the sword shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother. In other words, because of deception, you put yourself in a position of servitude. However, it doesn't end there. And it shall come to pass. Say, it shall come to pass. Come to pass. Say, it shall come to pass. Come to pass. <laughs> See, if you're in bondage, if you've got the devil's yoke around your neck, if he's deceiving you, then you ought to live for it shall come to pass. Amen. It shall come to pass. Notice this very closely. It is the key to linking yourself with the anointing. It shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion. Now notice he said, because of deception, you are a servant now. You are a slave. You will serve your brother. However, it shall come to pass. There's coming a time when you will have the dominion. And when you have the dominion, thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. Now notice what he said. Follow this closely. If you don't follow it, it's going to go right over you. Isaiah, by the Spirit of God, said, the anointing breaks the yoke. <clears throat> Say the anointing breaks the yoke. Say it loud. 
He said, the anointing breaks the yoke. Here, Isaac says that dominion breaks the yoke. Now, is the Bible contradicting itself? It is not. It complements itself. Isaac, by the Spirit of God, says it takes the anointing to break the yoke. Yet Isaac said dominion breaks the yoke. I submit to you that dominion brings anointing which breaks the yoke. Did you hear me? Say the anointing breaks the yoke. The anointing breaks the yoke. The anointing breaks the yoke. When is it when you notice the times that you've experienced the anointing, you've seen the anointing break the yoke? What happened? Somebody started walking in dominion. Somebody tapped into dominion, which brought on the anointing, which caused the yoke to be destroyed. Let me say it this way. When you learn to walk in dominion, it will bring the anointing. And the anointing will break the yoke. Say this with me. Walking in dominion, Walking in dominion. Brings, the brings the anointing. And the anointing, and the anointing. Breaks, the breaks the yoke. Some of you are not participating. Now, if you don't participate, I'm going to ask you to leave and we'll bring in a new group. <laughs> Say this. Walking in dominion, Walking in dominion. Brings the anointing. Breaks the yoke. Walking in dominion. Brings the anointing. And the anointing. Breaks the yoke. Walking in dominion. Brings the anointing. And the anointing. Breaks the yoke. Walking in dominion. Brings the anointing. And the anointing. Breaks the yoke. Have you got it? Yeah. Notice this. Now, I don't know how you think, but this is the way I think. I believe I'm on to something here. If, I, if, I'm, if I'm thinking correctly, and the way my mind operates, I don't know how yours operates, but I think like this. All right, now wait a minute. The anointing breaks the yoke. But here he says, when I have dominion, it'll break the yoke. So evidently, dominion and anointing are linked together. Now, is that fair thinking to you? Yes. Evidently, the anointing and walking in dominion are linked together. And I know it's true in my own life. The times I've experienced anointing the greatest is when I was walking in the dominion the greatest. Now, notice this. Here's the way I'm thinking now. All right? It's the anointing that breaks the yoke. If I've got a yoke, if I'm in bondage to the devil, then what I need is the anointing. Because without the anointing, I can't get it broken. I need the anointing. Well, how does the anointing come? Well, Isaac said, through dominion. So evidently, if I ever learn to walk in dominion, it will bring the anointing, and at the very sight of the anointing, the yoke's destroyed. Now, follow my thinking. So far, I understand. Walking in dominion brings the anointing, and the anointing breaks the yoke. The next thing I need to know is how do you walk in dominion? If I can ever learn to walk in dominion, it would bring the anointing, and the anointing would break the yoke. Say it this way, out loud. In fact, look at a neighbor while you're saying it. Tell it to them. If I could ever learn to walk in dominion, it would bring the anointing. And the anointing would break the yoke. Turn around, look at somebody else and tell them this. If I could ever learn to walk in dominion, it would bring the anointing. And the anointing would break the yoke. Now turn around, look at somebody behind you and say it this way. If you would ever learn to walk in dominion, it would bring the anointing. And the anointing would break the yoke. Have you got it? Have you got it? All right, now, 
Looks like to me the only thing we, we're left with now is how do you walk in the dominion? Well, let me show you something. Are you ready to riot? This gentleman, once he hears this, now see, he's sitting over here in bondage. Do you notice he hadn't got up and went back to his seat? He can't. He's under my authority because he's deceived. But if he ever hears what I'm about to tell you, it's going to break the yoke off his neck. Are you ready? Well, my time's up. Now, let's see. Oh, wouldn't it be a shame if he had to sit here the rest of the week? <laughs> Listen to this again now. Here's the King James. And by thy sword shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother, and it shall come to pass when. Notice, none of this is going to come to pass until when. When what? When thou shalt have the dominion. That yoke is not coming off your neck until you walk in dominion. It shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. Now, our only problem is how do you walk in dominion? Well, I believe I can answer that for you by giving you the new international version of this scripture. Listen to it closely. Here's how you walk in dominion, which brings the anointing. And when the anointing comes, it destroys the yoke. Just to be sure you're with me, say it again. If I learn to walk in dominion, in dominion it brings the anointing. Brings the anointing. And, the anointing and the anointing breaks the yoke. Breaks the yoke. Now say this, Brother Jerry, Brother Jerry please, tell us please tell us how to walk in dominion. How to walk in dominion. If I learn to walk in dominion, walk in it'll bring the anointing. And the, and the anointing will break the yoke. Now, some of you are wondering why I'm having to go over that over and over and over again. Because you are disciples of Jesus. And he had to say to them many times, and again I say unto thee. <laughs> Repetition is how you get it in you. See, a lot of people only hear enough to get in trouble. Let's see. Now, what did he say in there today? If I could get to a Oral Roberts meeting where the anointing is, I could be healed. Now, that's what, that's what a lot of people, that's all they get. He said something about Oral Roberts, said something about a meeting, said something about anointing, and people get healed. Yeah, I heard him. I heard him, Ethel. Said if we could get to ORU, we'd get healed. Are you still here? Just to be sure you're still here, say this with me. If I could ever learn to walk in dominion, it would bring the anointing. And the anointing would break the yoke. Turn around, look at a neighbor and say, he's about to tell us. Turn around to another neighbor and say, I hope. All right, here we go. Are you ready? Here's the new international version. <clears throat> The King James said, When thou shalt have the dominion, thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. Here's the new international version. Here's how you walk in dominion. When you grow restless. When you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. Restless. He said, when you grow restless. Now, somebody's thinking, I thought she was going to give us a revelation. I just did. You missed it. He said, when you grow restless, when you grow restless, let me give you the Texas definition for restless. Fed up. Fed up. Say fed up. God is telling us when you get to the point in your life where you grow restless with your bondage, that's when you'll walk in dominion. And when you walk in dominion, it brings the anointing and the anointing will destroy it.
Amen. You have to become restless. Let me tell you why a lot of people never get healed, never get out of bondage. They're not fed up with it. You never get out of it until you're fed up with it. That's exactly how you got saved. You got fed up with going to hell. You got fed up with that old miserable life. You got fed up. And when you got fed up, you started walking in dominion. And the dominion brought the anointing. And the anointing destroyed the yoke. And some of you sitting out there telling me, well, I don't know how to get restless. Yes, you do. You, you do it in a natural all the time, you ugly outfit. Some of you women get restless at home. You get fed up. And when you get fed up, sweetheart, you start walking in dominion. And everybody in the house knows you fed up. Amen. Amen. You know how to get fed up in the natural. You do it all the time. You tell your husband uh, about three or four nights in a row, come on in, dinner's ready, and he don't show up, and it gets cold. Spirit of restlessness comes on thee. Spirit of fed up comes on thee. And that's when he finds out how strong the weaker vessel is. Brother, I want you to know when you get fed up, I don't care if you, you are supposed to be the weaker vessel. Your voice changes, your countenance changes. Everybody in the house knows mama is in dominion. Run! And I want, I want you to know when she starts walking in dominion, yokes around that house start getting broke. Things start changing around there. You're the same way, sir, on the job when you've been pushed around and pushed around and promised this and promised that and they never come through. There finally comes a point in your life instead of just going home and talking about it all the time and talking about it all the time and talking about it all the time, there finally comes a point you walk in there and you tell the boss, I'm tired of you lying to me. Either give me the raise or show me the door. And something happens. You know how to get fed up. You get fed up at home and then the, then the devil is trying to rob you of your spiritual rights, your blessings. Well, I guess it's the Lord's will. You're not fed up. That's the reason some people have to come through prayer lines every service. They're not fed up. They're not fed up. They're just like old Pharaoh. Remember... All them frogs that showed up in Egypt? I heard Brother Copeland tell this one time. I'll never forget as long as I live. Still, sometimes I wake up thinking about it and laugh. It just, it just marked my consciousness. Oh, Pharaoh, Bible said Egypt was full of frogs. He wouldn't let God's people go. There came that plague of frogs. The Bible said there were frogs everywhere. They said they were in his bedchamber. Can you imagine sleeping with frogs? Green frogs, brown frogs, slimy frogs, chirp all night frogs. They're in bed with you. Get the picture, folks. This is not just writings. It happened. Frogs were in their bed. Frogs were in their pajamas. They got up the next morning, and the Bible said frogs were in their ovens and frogs were in their dough. Can you imagine getting up this morning in your hotel room? Frogs are everywhere. You're having to try to walk over frogs, and they're in your pajamas. And you order room service and pull that little silver tray off. There's a frog on your biscuit. Frogs everywhere. Frogs everywhere. Now, you know, you might be able to put up with that for, you know, a little while, but after all day long, everywhere you look is frogs. They're all over you. They're everywhere. Finally, Pharaoh couldn't take anymore, and he calls Moses in, and he says, Moses, entreat your God to get rid of these frogs, please. Moses said, okay, when? And stupid Pharaoh said, tomorrow. Like Brother Copeland said, 
Give me one more night with them frogs. <laughs> now don't laugh too hard at Pharaoh because some of you have done the same thing. One of these days I'll get my healing. One of these days what you're saying is I'm not fed up yet. When you go into those pity parties, that's when the devil knows you hadn't had enough. You only tap into dominion when you reach a point in your life where you fed up, where you draw the battle lines and you tell the devil, enough is enough, no more. Amen. And that spirit of restlessness comes on you. And that's when you start walking in dominion. That's when you grab your Bible and you tell the devil, all right, you push me far enough. I'm not taking this anymore. You've robbed me of my finances, robbed me of my family, robbed me of my health. You're trying to rob everything God promised me I could have. All right, devil, if it's a fight you want, a fight you're going to get, it is written. Amen. Get fed up. When you get fed up, that's when the devil has to flee. As long as you're still whining, bawling, and squalling about it, he don't leave. Because there's no anointing in that. It's when you walk in dominion, it brings the anointing. And the anointing destroys the yoke. The Living Bible said it this way. It said, you will serve for a time, but you will finally shake loose and go free. When? When you get restless. Now... Back to the slave amount over here. He finds out he don't have to live that way no more. You can't talk him into it anymore. Amen. Give him a hand for shaking loose and going free. Amen. It's time for the body of Christ to get fed up. Time for the body of Christ to take on a spirit of restlessness. I'm not talking about a destructive way, an evil way. I'm talking about a spirit of restlessness that comes from the Holy Ghost where you're no longer satisfied, where you tell the devil enough is enough. I'm not being pushed around another minute. You don't own me. I'm not your property. You are not my God. Who do you think you are coming in this house and tearing up everything and putting my kids on drugs and trying to divide my marriage. Who do you think you are, devil? In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the Bible says if I ever come into dominion, it'll bring the anointing, and the anointing breaks the yoke. Well, devil, yoke time, yoke breaking time has come. Amen. You got to get fed up. You got to get fed up. See, some of you right now, you're so fed up just by listening to me preach. You're thinking, oh, there's several things. As soon as I get home, I'm going to get fed up. <laughs> now, see, it's not, just, it's not enough to just get inspired. So you're inspired right now. Some of you are so inspired, you feel like biting the back out of that seat in front of you. <laughs> some of you, I, I've seen some of you, listen, listen at him, listen at him. You, know, you get inspired. But that inspiration can leave you before you get out the building. Ain't no need you waiting until you get home to do something about it. I challenge you. And I don't know. I don't know about California, but it, where I grew up in Louisiana, we had a saying. And when this saying came across to a young boy, you had to do it. I double dog dare you. <laughs> I double dog dare every one of you in here 
to stand to your feet, get fed up with the devil, and tell him to get off your back once and for all and reach up there and jerk that yoke off your neck. Do it. Do it. Do it. Praise the Lord. I believe this message has absolutely set you free. I believe you were inspired to get to the place in your life where you're fed up with Satan taking control. You're fed up with him stealing from you. I believe a spirit of restlessness has come on you, and you're shouting along with the group there in that video that made up their mind in the name of Jesus they were no longer going to be in bondage. Praise God. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke. Now, you know how to do it. Tap into God's anointing. You can do it. And when the anointing comes, Satan will flee. Praise God. The anointing is on the Word. You must begin to do what the Bible says. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It's time for you to say so. Tell him you're fed up with being sick. Tell him what God says. By his stripes you are healed. Tell him you're fed up with being broke and in poverty and always suffering lack. Tell him what the Bible says. Shout it to him that it is the will of God that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. That's all it is to it. Learn to speak God's word. Keep an attitude of, of restlessness in your spirit and never let the devil bind you up again. Praise God. I trust once again that this message has been a blessing to you.